strong and fear not. Behold, the Lord our God will come, and he will save us. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad, the desert shall rejoice and blossom, like the crocus it shall blossom abundantly, and rejoice with joy and singing. Say to the who are of a fearful heart. Be strong and fear not. Behold, the Lord our God will come, and he Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Jesus said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. 
For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. with you and also with you let us pray stir up your power O Lord and with great might come among us and because we are sorely hindered by our sins let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins they shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For, the earth, for as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our tongue with shouts of 
Paul's first letters to the Thessalonians. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one who you do not know the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord.
preaching in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> All right, so I, I'm actually filming this the Tuesday before you're watching it. So we just did the second Sunday in Advent uh, two days ago, and it feels weird to be preaching to you on a Tuesday. And then right now, I've got these very joyful noises of uh, Bandy screaming outside as he's playing, and I hope you can hear those. And then lately, uh, my sermons have been filled uh, rather joyfully with the screams of children. On the first Sunday of Advent, uh, we all filmed and here together in one take, and then Bandy's nanny is one of our singers, and then so she was here with us. So Bandy wandered around and had an epic meltdown in the middle of my sermon. And this past Sunday, we baptized Finn. And Finn is three years old. And then he had a lot of joyful interruptions during that live service as well. And then so it's only appropriate that we can hear Bandy screaming just outside. He is the voice literally crying out in the wilderness, well, outside in uh, the little park outside the church. And John the Baptist, the voice that cries out in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord, the voice out in the wilderness calling us to repent our sins, he's such an incredible character, and he has so much to teach us in our day to day. He was preparing for the coming of Christ. He was preparing the way for Jesus to start his ministry. There's a tremendous amount of overlap between John's ministry and Jesus's. They seem to be partners um, going toward the same goal. Their missions, their unique duties were different, but they ultimately worked together. And then in the season of Advent, we're just not remembering when humanity was preparing for the incarnation of God, that is Jesus Christ. We are also preparing ourselves in realizing that we are in a perpetual season of anticipation for the second coming of Christ. We proclaim that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again, and we are constantly in this liminal, this in-between space of what once was and what will be again. And then this time around, we are the voice crying out in the wilderness. Our job is never quite done, but we are called to be that voice, to call all of humanity to make straight the paths of the Lord, to proclaim the repentance of sins. And this is supposed to prepare ourselves and our neighbors for the coming of Christ. And in light of the recent news of me leaving, it's, it's kind of profound. It's, it's strange to be living in this liminal time, both personally in my family life and also in the life of the church. It all seems very appropriate for Advent. And part of me thinks that my job here just wasn't done. There's so many things I still want to tell you. There's so many things I still want to see in this church. But I was never the person that came in here to fix everything. Just like you, I was just another voice crying out in the wilderness to help prepare. We, never one of, never a single one of us, is the person that is going to come and make everything right, to finish the work of the church, that has always been Christ. And our job is to constantly prepare, to realize that we'll never quite be there. But just the task of preparing is sacred within itself. And then we can look back over the course of the last four years and see all of the changes that have happened. And then we are not perfect. We make plenty of mistakes. I have made plenty of mistakes. My very first sermon to you was that I will disappoint you. And I think I have a time or two. But if we look at the changes that have happened around here, I hope with heaps of humility that we are a little bit more ready 
for Christ to come than we were a few years ago. The church feels a little bit more open, a little bit more centered on the love of Christ, a little bit less centered on us and what the church can do for us, and a little bit more centered on just the incredible potential we have of proclaiming the gospel in our community. And then what you are called to do is to continue that work. If all of this stops when I leave, then all of our preparation these last four years will be for naught. Then it'll just be proof that all of the effort was based on an individual's will, not our collective desire to serve Christ. And that is what we constantly need to be focused on. Every single person in the church is absolutely essential. But at the same time, if one person is not able to show up that Sunday, or if one person disappears, the church needs to be able to continue to do her ministry. I like to think that I've had a positive influence here, but the good that we've done, it wasn't because of me. You did the vast majority of that work. That always has been you. And then in the coming year, it might be hard while you wait for a new minister to come and fill my seat, and they will be different. They will have strengths that I do not have, and then they will be lacking in maybe ways I excel in. But regardless of what their strengths and weaknesses are, that is who God is calling to serve here. In the exact same way that God is calling you to serve in this church. And it's not about what we can accomplish. It's not about what we can wrap up, what we can feel like is finished. It's about the act of preparing. It's about the act of staying awake. It's about listening to that voice out into the wilderness, regardless of whether or not it's John the Baptist or a child calling us to come show them love and to teach them the gospel. We are always called to respond to that voice. In this place, these walls, um, these spaces that we've renovated, they're nothing without you. They're nothing without you showing up and being ready to listen, to listen to your neighbor and to listen to the spirit moving you. The church has always been about you. And it's always been about that in-between space of Christ arriving, dying, resurrecting and waiting for the second coming of Christ. We are people of preparation, the people of just around the corner, but not quite yet. We are people that are called to wait and to work and to love and to encourage each other along the way. And my hope for you is that when I'm able to come back and visit a year or two from now, that you are still focused on the love of Christ. Not that you just show up and listen to whomever's preaching, but that you're willing to come and listen to how you are called to affect the change that needs to happen and how you are called to work with the people in the pew next to you to do the good work of Christ. A couple months ago, when we were still in Lent, ah, golly, that was a few months ago, a few months ago when we were in Lent and we were st stuck in the middle of this pandemic, I told you we were in a whole season of Lent, of waiting, of learning to live without. But in reality, 
we have always been our entire lives in a season of Advent. It's not about learning to live without. It's about learning to live with anticipation and eagerness to get ready for what is about to come. To trust that God is working in us in ways that we cannot yet see. And to trust that God has not given up on us. And that when we are ready, we, through prayer and hard work, heaps of humility and boldness, that we will be ready when Christ comes again. God bless you, my friends, and I wish you a holy advent. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed on page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I ask your prayer for God's people throughout the world, for our Bishop Mark, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. We pray especially for our own needs and those of others, especially Lou, Julia, Scott, Marie, Pam, John, Hilda, Mike, Sarah, Jane, Larry, David, Pete, Darlene, Sharon, Ula, Kathy, Ron, Kathy, Carolia, Pat, Catherine, Linda, Crystal, Tammy, Mallory, James, Rocky, 
Catherine, Mary Ruth, Melissa, Colette, Linda, Jimmy, Lewis, Linda Bender, Kristen, Pat, David Bullens, Derek and his family, Philip, Helen, Carol, Barbara, Sherry, Greg Johnson, Kristen and Danny, and Richard Cutler. Pray in the words our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. announcement from the Roanoke Valley Children's Choir. Think about your neighbors, think about your friends, think about your elders, on us they do depend. Let's all get together and do what we've been asked. Social distance, wash your hands and wear a mask. Social distance, wash your hands and wear a mask. Thank you.